everyone. Uh, welcome to We'll Talk with Artists. My name is Martha Campbell. Uh, I've worked for MFA for five years now. I started out when I was still in high school, actually, as an intern. Um, if you don't know what MFA is, welcome. Uh, we're a visual arts nonprofit, and our mission is to create meaningful connections in the community through art. Uh, one of the ways we do this is with events like this, where we get to sit down and talk about art with our members who make art. Um, with all that being said, I'd like to introduce the host of our show, Will Scott. Will is an art historian. Uh, he's a wonderful photographer, and he's the recently retired head of adult programs for the National Gallery of Art. Will is on our board of directors and is one of the most uniquely qualified members to help bridge the gap between artists and the public, like we're doing tonight. Uh, tonight, we have local Annapolis wood turner, Alan Alexopoulos. Alan is a longtime member of MFA, the American Association of Wood Turners, and the Chesapeake Wood Turners. You can see more of Alan's work at his website, lathescapes.com. Uh, last, I will be monitoring the Q&A, so I'm going to just disappear and leave you with Will and Alan. So whenever you guys are ready, let's get started. Okay, Martha, thanks for that great introduction. Uh, and despite her youth, uh, Martha has been a great asset to the MFA uh, and is going to be even more so. Uh, as she takes up uh, full-time work for us. Um, well, I, what we're really trying to do with this program uh, to expand just a little bit is because of the COVID crisis and the fact that we can't actually have uh, visitors to any uh, brick and mortar exhibits in the Circle Gallery, uh, we wanted to continue to be of service both to our public, uh, all of you who are listening, and uh, I see a few of our member artists are already tuned in, but also to our member artists, as Alan uh, is. And we wanted to have an opportunity to let those member artists tell everyone uh, a little bit more about who they are and how they do what they do and why they're doing what they do. Um, I've always been, I think, um, coming from my background, curious and don't have all the opportunities that I have wished that I had to talk to fellow artists uh, in the MFA and learn more about uh, what it is that they're doing. So uh, I've been privileged to choose the artists, at least these first few sessions, and I've always loved turned wood. Although again, my wife made me stop buying turned wood vessels because after three or four, she said, well, where are we gonna put them? Because we, we both collect other things too. So anyhow, uh, Alan's work has always impressed me because of its variety and before, because of its inventiveness. Uh, so thank you, Alan, for agreeing to um, subject yourself to this. <laughs> uh, so first, why don't you just say a little bit about when you began turning wood, uh, what led you to that, and um, what you might have been doing with your time otherwise. Uh, yeah. Thanks for that wonderful intro. And uh, my, my wood turning story started sometime around the year 2000. Uh, prior to that, uh, aside from doing my day job as an engineer, um, I had built uh, some furniture and, and odds and ends that all had one thing in common right angles. Everything was square, uh, or square off, pardon me. And uh, I just uh, thought that, you know, it'd really be kind of fun to have a turned column or do something that was round uh, on some of my pieces. So uh, that was sort of the, uh, the initial starting point for my journey through the wood turning world, uh, which actually took me over the, over the Chesapeake Bay to the eastern shore once upon a time where uh, I passed a tent sale that was going on. I figured, well, let me just stop in and see what they've got, because I'm always interested in tools. Uh, and sure enough, they had a little lathe, uh, not very high quality. I bought it and I bought some tools. I paid less than 100 bucks for everything, so you can imagine the lack of quality and all that. And I took it all home and I started uh, dabbling. Uh, I bought a whole bunch of books and you know I did the normal try it on your own thing and see how far you can get. I enjoyed it, but I realized uh, I wasn't going to go anywhere unless I got some professional assistance. Well, that, and, uh, uh, Alan, if I may, let me interrupt you right sorry. there because that's 
not at all what I expected you to say. Uh, it oh. all makes sense being an engineer, but I no, I just I'm kind of surprised that this isn't something that you've done for a while, and that in a way it is a, a different avenue to explore. You mentioned you know circles, and so you said you made some furniture. Do you have much of a, um, did you have, at the time you began, much of an awareness of the history of furniture making and the different kinds of turned forms that have been used in throughout history in furniture making? Did that give you any inspiration or initial ideas about what you would do? Uh, I had a limited understanding of, of, of uh, you know, what the possibilities were, but it, it's based almost entirely on museums, which I, I always enjoy going through. And uh, I have a, a fair collection of interesting books that kind of show me the evolution of furniture and, and forms in general uh, over the ages. And uh, it didn't take long to find out that wood turning started back with, at least, with the Egyptians. It's okay. nothing new. <laughs> The tools we use, of course, are you know completely changed, but the the basic idea hasn't really changed that much. Well, I, that's sort of the way that I was thinking about it when I started to talk with you and think about inviting you to do this because, as a trained art historian, furniture was never a primary interest of mine in that study. But it's something that, of course, I was uh, introduced to and put in contact with. Now, having said that, both what you said about yourself and I just said about myself, one thing that always attracted me to your work is these free, uh, more or less abstract, uh, non-symmetrical forms. What brought you to doing that kind of work? Well, I, again, it was an evolutionary process that I went through. And as, uh, as I uh, learned more and more about the uh, the craft of wood turning, the gaining the skills that you need to be safe, and kind of aware of what the possibilities were, I started uh, looking around. Uh, well, actually, not too much on the internet because the internet was a lot different 20 years ago than it is now. Uh, but uh, I I ended up attending just off the cuff a Chesapeake Wood Turners monthly meeting. I just walked in unannounced because they invite people in. And uh, I got to know some of the folks that were in there and one thing led to another. And I started taking classes at Maryland Hall for the Creative Arts. And one of my uh, esteemed, most esteemed instructors, Joe Dickey. Joe who? I don't think I've heard of him. Yeah, I haven't heard of him before. <laughs> Uh, and, and others. Uh, uh, I, I was blessed with uh, just kind of being in the right place at the right time to be able to learn from the, the, the true masters of, of this uh, art form. So uh, anyway, one thing led to another and I realized that I, you know, making bowls, simple bowls, is interesting. But what's even more interesting is doing natural edge pieces and, and other, as you noted, free form types yeah. of work. While, while we're talking about this point, Martha, can you put up one of those freeform vessels? So can you say a little bit about that, Alan, uh, how you did it and how far along in your evolution, uh, the development of your work does, well, I see, I didn't notice before. Yeah, the, so how, yeah, how long did it take you to get to something that uh, complex? Well, it, it took me quite a while because uh, I had no idea how to actually do the carving. You know, for anyone out there that you know, has not been familiar with wood turning, that all of the undulations around the rim of that piece have been hand carved. Uh, we didn't bend the wood. I, I, sometimes people kind of misunderstand what you know what you need to do to make a piece like that. And uh, it was only after I took a uh, a class with uh, a fellow named Charles Farrar, who's a wonderful wood turner. Um, who uh, that's through that class I learned how to actually do the carving and develop the the shapes that are in there. So this is a good example of sort of a hybrid, classic shape on the bottom, kind of like a, a standard bowl if you want to call it that. And then we freeform the the rim, which I think uh, really makes the piece uh, interesting. So you turned it. 
start from the bottom, from the foot. Mm -hmm. You turned it until you got to that point where the, um, the pattern in the wood disappears and it becomes, well, not disappears, but it becomes more uniform in color and grain. And then mm -hmm. you carved from there up. Correct. The, the trick with this is um, as you do the development of the shape, you leave, you, uh, you turn the, the bottom fairly right. thin, you know, maybe a quarter of an inch or three eighths, something like that. But as you come up the sides of the piece, you flare it out so that across the, the top of these, these uh, folds, if you want to call them that, the piece might be two inches thick. And so you, you have enough material, material to work with. Yep, that's the yeah. trick. Uh, can, Martha, can we slide back to that array of tools? So uh, just real quick, Alan, um, which of these tools would be involved in a piece like that? Not necessarily that piece, but one like mm -hmm. that, and how would they be used? Well, if you look uh, dead center, uh, there's a bowl gouge. In fact, if you look at the word wood turning, the OO in wood uh -huh. just goes straight up. It's that, that tool. Yeah. That's probably... Um, 80 to 85 percent of the the actual uh, turning was done with that tool. Wow. And then, and then, of course, carving. There's a whole different set of tools that you use to uh, to to do the carving. Are the carving tools more like knives? Um, well, there there's a whole bunch of things. Uh, some of them are uh, cutting tools, like knives, but others are. Uh, Think of it as grinding tools with real coarse grinding uh, burrs that we, we use. Yeah, okay. Uh, and well, since we don't have images of those, do we? You didn't know. No, okay. So just point out one or two of these others to uh, perhaps quickly say what different effect each tool has. I'm curious about there's also different. How do you actually use them? What results from their use? Well, it turns out that um, there's a mix of turning tools in this slide. Some of them are used for doing the, you know, bowl shapes that we just took a, took a quick look at, but other ones are, are actually uh, designed for doing uh, spindle work. So if you were doing uh, uh, a baluster or some kind of a uh, I, we call it a long grain wood turning, you would probably want to use something like the roughing gouge, which is, oh my gosh, it's the one, two, three, the fourth tool from the right. Uh, wow. Oops, I'm sorry, the, the, the right of the slide. <laughs> right of the slide, uh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, and that's, that's for just quickly re removing a whole bunch of stock to uh, make the piece round and cylindrical. And then there are... Um, Elsewhere in there, there are gouges that are used for uh, doing spindle work, like for doing coves um, and for beads. And over on the, the left side of the slide, you'll see a couple of uh, tools that have uh, kind of a, well, it looks like a flat edge that's on an angle. Those are called skews. And those are for doing real fine uh, uh, smoothing of surfaces. Uh, by shearing the fibers. So you can get a tremendously fine finish on a spindle. Uh, these don't work at all on, on, uh, on uh, uh, bowl work, if you, yeah. if you want to call it that. Well, since you're now talking about spindles, and earlier we touched on sort of historical uh, antecedents for this kind of work, uh, Martha, maybe you could, um, there's a couple of very classical looking symmetrical pieces if you can pull up those are the uh, those are etruscan aren't they most of them that's uh, yeah, roman right. etruscan and greek yeah so you have some pieces that i've admired that look very much like this but they're not replicas they're not copies so martha if you want to flip on to there you go mm -hmm. it, so what are you what alan are you as a, a turner trying to do in these pieces? Well, I think the, uh, the, the best way to describe my, my efforts in, in both of these pieces was to take a, a form that's been around for literally thousands of years um, and a form which was originally designed to be more like a piece of tupper, Tupperware, you know, food storage, that, that kind of thing. 
and bring it fast forward to you know our our modern times, um, stretch things out, you know, change the shape a little bit to make it a little bit more pleasing, and also I wanted to address the the foot. If if you looked at that previous slide, none of those old uh, amphorae had a uh, a base on it. They they all came down to a, like a little uh, uh, almost like a spigot on the bottom, and and that, that's because it was actually easier to transport them in, in uh, ships if they were shaped that way. If they had a uh, foot on them, it, the foot would probably break. So uh, in both pieces, I, I actually uh, tried to resolve, you know, like how can I create a foot for something that's not supposed to have a foot? <laughs> so uh, you can kind of see yeah. basically my solution to that problem. And so um, the, those feet are two different pieces of wood assembled to the main body? That's correct. Uh, on the uh, piece on the left, the Etruscan amphora, uh, the base is made out of a piece of lignum vitae, which is a mm -hmm. extraordinarily hard yeah. wood. It's uh, got a lot of oil in it, and it's just lovely. And then a piece of ebony, uh, that's the post, that kind of goes up into a hollow that I made in the uh, bottom of the uh, amphora. Well, I'm going to, um, I've tried not to do this in the previous talks, but I am going to interject a little bit of art historical uh, um, analysis to this because you've done something that as a historian of art, I find fascinating. You took a utilitarian form and elevated it to the world of art by placing it on a pedestal. And in late 19th century uh, Western sculpture, one of the biggest uh, debates and dialogues was removing sculpture from the world of art and moving it into the world of daily human experience by taking away the bases. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think this is, to me, very significant that you have taken this utilitarian form and really literally transformed it into um, fine art. So uh, I, I knew there was a reason I was interested in your work other than its sheer <laughs> visual beauty. Uh, okay, um, so we talked a little bit about tools and, and sources. Um, now the materials are always wood and you've mentioned a number of different varieties. I, Say a little bit about how you select the wood and what it is about different wood uh, types of wood that bring you to utilize it. Well, the wood selection is is something that, it, for me, it kind of depends on what it is I'm trying to uh, to design. Uh, and and actually, the, these two amphora are really good examples of wood selection. The piece on the left. Uh, the, the Etruscan piece. Um, I'm sure you've noticed there's a, what, uh, for lack of better, I'll call a defect in the side. And it turns out that chunk of wood is what we typically refer to as found wood. It's wood that we otherwise really don't have any way of identifying. And it just turns out that it appealed to me. And I kind of like the fact that there was, uh, you know, there was something very natural in it. And uh, after you know doing the the turning and and the finish work and all that, I think it really uh, worked out pretty well. Yeah. Uh, by the way, the the handles on both these pieces are carved. By the way, they're not they're not glued on or anything. It, that is all. In each case, those are single pieces of wood. On the, uh, the, one, the yeah, go ahead. The one on the uh, right of the screen that has the little finial is that. Yes. That's also ebony, though? It is. And actually, there's an interesting and very quick story about that. Uh, if you think back to the uh, photograph that we started with, with the amphora from the British Museum, uh, I found that very few existing amphora had caps. And the reason for that is really pretty simple. They would, they would be taken off and tossed you know, just like you take the lid off of a, you know, a, a soda or something. So uh, that, that's my interpretation as best as I could 
could develop it of what a cap might have looked like, you know, yeah. for a piece like that in, in antiquity. Yeah, well, that, that's fascinating too. Um, we're talking now about uh, your materials and your tools. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you ever had any accidents that really uh, made you aware of uh, what you have to think about from a practical safety point of view? Well, safety is uh, probably the one thing that keeps a lot of people from, uh, from uh, getting into the world of wood turning because after all, we've got a uh, large uh, machine tool that spins very heavy pieces of wood at very high speeds. So uh, there is always uh, a danger associated with it. And for that reason, and by the way, that's why I went and got professional guidance by taking coursework at Maryland Hall because right up front, they, they start with the safety aspects. And it turns out um, I have done things to my body. Fortunately, they were simple things. Uh, and uh, I still have all of my digits, which is a good thing. Uh, so uh, if you're careful, and we wear full face shields, uh, uh, there, there's some general practices that you have to and principles that you have to use uh, always when you're doing your your turning to make sure that you don't compromise your body so you never put yourself in a position where uh, like for example if a big chunk of wood flies off of a piece that you're working on you want it to hit the plastic or you want it to go by you you don't want it to go you know like up under your chin or hit you where it could really do a lot of damage that was exactly the question I was going to ask uh, in the form of what's the largest, uh, heaviest hunk of wood you've ever tried to uh, manipulate? Well, I think the largest piece was uh, a piece that ended up being called uh, a Tariac, and I'm pretty sure it's in the slide deck that I, I sent Martha. Um, and it turns out that piece was... Uh, it finished out at about 22 or 23 inches. So it's about yay by yay. And I know when I put... So how big is the finished piece? Finished piece is about 22 inches, uh, 22 and a half inches apart. And if you, you look carefully, um, there's a, a, a section on the, on the side. And unfortunately, I can't see, I can't see Martha's, uh, I can't see the slide right now. I don't know if anybody else can. Okay, there we go. Yeah, if you look over on the, uh, I guess, the left side of the picture, yeah, there's like a little peninsula that's sticking off the side. Yeah. And I did everything that I could to make sure that I preserve that in the finished piece. And that was very, very difficult because that's, that's a very fragile part of the, uh, the chunk of wood. So, and by the way, the... Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Bro. Everything that we're looking at is one piece of wood except for the pedestal. Correct. And, wow. yeah, and the post, of course. Yeah, yeah. And actually the rings that you see, those are not, uh, they're not added on, they're not, uh, they're not painted, they're not stained, they're, they're actually bleached. So if you could, you know, if we had a close-up, you could actually just look right through that bleach and see the wonderful figure that's uh, in the wood. And I, I did that with intention. I wanted people to enjoy the, uh, the actual natural qualities of that, that chunk of wood. Okay, you were, <laughs> this is fascinating, Alan, because this is where my eye was going. That's the natural fiber of the wood, but you did bleach those uh, bands to become lighter. Correct. Just regular Clorox? No. <laughs> now there's a uh, there's a pretty strong and <clears throat> industrial strength two part bleach that I used, and uh, I used carefully I might add, and uh, I had to apply it I think about a dozen times to to develop that much of a color difference between uh -huh. the uh, you know the the natural wood and, and it, um, okay. and also I don't know if you've if you noticed it but look at the base. The base has the exact same rings on them, and they're bleached. And from, uh, from a different the whole idea was to tie the two pieces together. Sure. Well, this is this is what I think is for me 
the essential quality of your work as a wood turner, because this is no longer to me something that I would easily identify as a turned piece of wood. You've, you've taken this raw natural material and you've taken a rather basic um, industrial process and yet you've created something of uh, very great beauty. And tell me a little bit about what you see as your goal or your purpose in being an artistic, if I may, woodturner. Well, more than anything, what I, what I try to do with my wood turning is to uh, bring out the, the natural qualities of wood whenever I can. Sometimes I embellish, and this Atariac is a good, good example of that. But most of the time, I kind of, I, I want to let the wood do the speaking. And in, in, in the wood turning community, we, we like to think in terms of, uh, if you look at a chunk of wood, you know, there's a really nice piece in there somewhere. And what we try to do is we try to extract it. You know, wood turning is a, a process of uh, kind of like decomposition. So uh, the, all of the pieces that uh, are in the slide deck and the ones that I've done over the years uh, have kind of had that as the overriding theme, you know, that bring out what Mother Nature has put there and, uh, and embellish when ne necessary. Well, now I'm going to do what an art, hi art historian often does that drives artists nuts. Okay, that's what you said you were doing. But I don't see you just doing that. I see you doing much more than that because you're not the, the circles for one thing and the way that you bleach them to create the uh, visual contrast uh, is something that you did. You didn't just find that in the wood. You did that consciously and deliberately. So why were you doing that? Can you? speak to that for a minute? Well, actually, uh, I, I can. And it, it, you'd have to actually be standing next to the piece to maybe appreciate what I'm about to say a little bit more. But um, this piece is actually about four inches thick or deep, if you want to call it that. So the, the center is actually much lower than the kind of the, the ring that surrounds it, the natural wood. So what I, what I wanted to do was separate the various layers of the wood with some sort of a feature that wouldn't uh, completely change the nature of, of the big leaf maple burl. And that's why I did the bleaching the way that I did. And I, I wanted to uh, also just add a, a little bit of extra interest. You know, in fact, uh, if, you're, if it makes a difference, the word atariac is basque for the, for the word portals. Oh. Not portholes, but portals. Yes. And yeah. This was sort of my my way of thinking about you know, looking out there into uh, outer space and going through a portal. Yeah. Well, Alan, I think that was especially um, brilliant of you to say it that way. Uh, you on your website call what you're doing lathe scapes, and I had a whole strategy planned of how I was going to ask you this or that to to explain that, but I think you just did. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I don't think that um, I have any questions that would elucidate that more or, or make you uh, think about it further. And I see that we've been at this for about 30 minutes or so, and it's been fascinating, but uh, I think it's time to open up for questions. Uh, Alan, I'm curious, when you're driving down the road and you see a tree has been cut down or fallen over, do you struggle with yourself about stopping and, and grabbing as much of it as you can? Boy, Jen, you, you, have, uh, you have just struck at the heart of the wood turning experience. <laughs> the answer is, of course. <laughs> and I, I've got to tell you, um, I have stopped, you know, while driving down the road and picked up spare, you know, basically it's firewood to most people. But we find that the most interesting chunks of wood are the ones that the sawmills don't want because they want nice flat pieces and then they do things to the wood to make it all uniform cut. We want variation, we want interest. And sometimes uh, you have to go looking for it and sometimes it kind of finds you. <laughs> Great question. One day I, I cycle 
And one day um, I had been cycling and noticed a, a fallen cherry tree. And I saw Joe Dickey a day or two later and I was all excited, Joe, Joe. And I think Joe was, if you know Joe, his expression said to me, I've heard this story before, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Is the sleigh ball in the slides, Alan? Um, it is not. Uh, I had to kind of pick and choose, and that one didn't quite, I didn't, didn't get to it, but that was a, an interesting piece. I've still got it, Chuck. <laughs> okay, that, that really exemplifies doing what the wood suggests, I think, and it's, it's an excellent piece, it always has been. Yeah. What, what Chuck is referring to is a piece that I did actually quite a few years ago where the uh, basically uh, a tree standing in the woods had been struck by lightning and it, it kind of put a big scar down the side and I ended up with the uh, with a part of that tree and I did a, a what we call a natural edge piece and the sapwood which is very light relative to the, uh, the heartwood uh, basically just reminded me of the runners on a sleigh. So the, hence the name of the piece, Sleigh Runner. And that, that actually was displayed, uh, I think several times at various events at Maryland Federation of Art. So uh, there may be some old timers that, that remember it. Uh, that little exchange right there makes me think, are there any of the slides that you submitted that you want to say a word or two about before we wrap up? Well, if you have Martha, you know, kind of uh, re recycle back to uh, maybe the third slide or, you know, we can real quickly go through and... Sure. Okay, let's go down, like this piece right here, the upper Pleistocene vessel. Um, interesting thing about that piece, from a safety point of view, turning it was a real challenge because yeah. it's about 17 or 18 inches across. And the best way I can describe that one was it was like turning a single bladed propeller Ooh. and developing the shape, which mm -hmm. I, I did. Also, that piece of wood is over 30,000 years old, and it came from New, New Zealand. Um, in fact, it was uh, recovered out of a uh, uh, peat bog. It's, there's like a cottage industry in New Zealand to recover this wood. So when that piece of wood was uh, part of a tree standing in the woods, there were saber-toothed tigers and other large beasts. How did, wandering how did you the obtain the wood? How did, how did, is there a market for that? You can go online and find it and order it? You can, can buy it. Uh, I was fortunate enough that one of my uh, good friends uh, gave me a couple pieces of it. Ah, nice. OK. Yep. So the next one, we'll talk about that one real quickly. Yeah. Just, there you go. Um, the, uh, the sphere is hollow, and th this is more of a traditional piece, and it kind of combines some bowl turning techniques and spindle work. And so you, you have these finials and the pedestal, and I even turned the base, which is out of a little bit of cherry. I think the uh, globe there is uh, olive wood, and the finials are ebony. Uh, there's even, it's hard to see, but down on the lower part of the the, the lower finial, there's actually what we call a captive ring. It's a little piece of the, the spindle that I actually turned and it's loose. It would, you know, it could actually slide up and down the, the finial. It's pretty neat. <laughs> yeah, that is. Okay, so let's do um, the next slide real quickly. Okay, this, this, is, this is a collection of pieces that I, I did over a couple year period and they're all hollow forms uh, uh, of one sort or another with a lid and a finial. And I just wanted to explore the whole world of, uh, uh, you know, completing uh, what we call boxes in the wood turning world, even though they're not, they don't look like the normal box that you'd expect. And uh, I used a variety of different uh, materials. I, uh, did different shapes. Uh, in fact, there's one piece that's called concavity and another one called convexity, just to kind of relate the, the name to the, the general shape. Um, by the way, the piece on the far left, Echoes, uh, 
Yeah. That piece actually survived not one, but both of the Ellicott City Great Floods. Oh, was it and in both, a shop or something? <laughs> no, it was in a gallery, and in both okay. cases, it uh, it was dug out of the mud, and Ooh. I had to recondition it and return the uh, finial. So there's a little bit of history on that one. Yeah, yeah. Well, you have a great eye for color and texture, uh, and and of course shape. Uh, that's just a that's a beautiful selection there. So how about one or two more, and then we'll wrap up. Okay, let's go down. Um, say to yeah one one more yeah well actually we'll use this one um, this piece is a, a kind of a combination of a traditional hollow form and a lot of carving and there's also a, a subtle surface texturing process that i i put this this piece through uh very hard to see it on on the slide but the whole idea there was to uh, kind of decompose the 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 grain structure so the rings, you know, a tree ring has a hard part and it has a soft part. And I actually used a sandblast process to get rid of the soft part. Uh -huh. And if you run your hand across this, it, would act, it actually is smooth, but it, it's textured. If you can imagine both of those things being true at the same time. Yeah. Uh, which is really kind of nice. Uh, and then the last slide would be, uh, I guess, number 10 there, the next one. And the only thing... Uh, uh, by the way, I use the same texturing technique on split rings there, but the whole idea with these two slides or two uh, pictures is to show that uh, it's very common to want to group wood turnings in pairs or triplets or multiples, you know, pick, pick a number. And uh, in both of these cases, I tried to uh, do that with some cohesiveness. So if you look carefully at split rings, you can actually see the, the core or the center of the tree Yes. Kind of down a, almost, uh, almost near the bottom and, uh, and then the sap wood on the top. So the, these two pieces actually relate very nicely, you know, one, one to the yeah. other. Yeah. By the way, they are hollow all the way down, top to bottom. They're tubes. They really are tubes. Oh, they really are tubes. Wow. Okay. Well, yeah. they're beautiful. And I think that little camping out, outward uh, from the center makes them almost come alive. That's, that's yep. a very nice presentation as well. Um, Thank you. Yeah, that, that's Mother Nature actually did that, that during the drying process. You know, tree, tree, wood changes its shape. So uh, we took advantage of that and w was able to get a little bit of curvature. Yeah, that's terrific. Which is kind of nifty. Well, and then finally, the uh, tiger family over there on the right, um, the, the, they're actually um, what I call complex hyperboloid shapes something I've been playing with for quite a few years. And uh, they're, they're weighted. They, they're, the general design is of a candlestick that's sort of been stretched out, you know, like you're trying to stretch a piece of taffy. And uh, in this case, the tiger comes from the material. Yeah. The, the, that's a tiger stripe maple that I used, which relates all the pieces together. Well, Alan, yeah, I'm even more impressed with your work after uh, hearing you talk about it so, uh, so well. And I uh, hope everybody else has enjoyed tonight's program and you'll tune in again for future programs. And um, Alan, do you want to quickly tell people where they can find your work other than your website? Yeah, uh, on my website, I have links to, the, uh, to a gallery in Savage Mill that is currently uh, carrying my, my, uh, some of my work. That's called Horse Spirit Arts Gallery. And I certainly do everything I can to participate with uh, you know, the MFA at different events that we, we have there. Uh, so Horse Spirit for the near term. And by the way, like most galleries, they are not quite open for business yet. So they have an online presence that they uh, reluctantly got into, but I'm glad they did. Well, uh, thanks again, Alan. I think it's been really fascinating and I love your work and uh, I appreciate all of you listening in and I hope you've enjoyed our conversation and you'll come back next week. Thanks, Martha. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Night. Martha. Thank you, Will. Well, yeah, thanks, everybody. Night.